The entrance of God's word gives light and understanding to the simple. Be yielded and open your hearts to the light of God's word through his servant, Pastor Chintok Ishaku. God bless you. Psalm 24, if you will. We'll start reading from verse 1. But let me give you a recap before we read. We've been talking about the river of God and how that everything that it comes in contact with receives life. So let's let's do a quick recap. We started from Ezekiel chapter 47. And in Ezekiel chapter 47, we saw a river that flowed from the temple. Do you remember that? Okay, now for those of you who have not been here, please follow me because I can see a number of people who came in for convocation and all that. Hallelujah. God bless you. I'm glad you came. Amen. I wish I was there to eat your rice yesterday, but it's not too late. Glory. Hallelujah. All right. So, we started from the river of God. I want to do a very quick recap within, say, the next five, ten minutes so that you can capture the heart of what the Lord has been saying to us as a people. Because today, I intend that we press into who shall ascend the mountain of the law all right and it's on that a general topic the god man we're actually considering who the god man is um i would have loved to say the man of god but i think that the words man of god have been abused and because it has been abused it does not carry as it were the essence when you hear man of god so we call it the god man so that you understand that divinity can enter into humanity and find expression in such a context that everything that is flesh can see the glory of the Lord. Because in Isaiah chapter 40, you will see that the end of it is so that the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. But you find out that when the Spirit of God sits, He dries out flesh. Oh, see, I don't like Isaiah 40. It's a scripture I love to teach. Because the Bible says that the grass with us, what the voice said, ah, what should I cry? And then, or I said, what shall I cry? And then the voice said to me, cry that all flesh is grass. And that the glory of flesh is like the flower. He said, the grass with us, the flower fades. Why? Because the breath of the Lord is upon it. Or, once the ruach of God comes upon a person, what it does is it withers the grass. What is the grass? What is the grass? So, flesh withers at the presence of the spirit. Then the Bible says the flower fades. What's the flower? The glory. That means that there are certain things you do from flesh that look glorious. So flesh is not without its glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on guys. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I work hard, I will buy, buy a good car. It doesn't mean God gave it to me. It's flesh. It's the arm of flesh. It worked. Are you following me? You remember on, on Tuesday, we're considering, on Wednesday, we're considering Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I said to you that one of the things that God was fighting very dearly in Israel was, He said, Least you get to a point where you have abundance, and then you start to say that my might or the strength of my hand has brought me this wealth. What did He say? He said, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that gives you the power to get wealth. Are you following me? And I, I, we took we took Deuteronomy chapter 8 and we saw the reason why God took them through the wilderness. The Bible says to humble them, to prove them, to see what is in their heart, whether they will do it, they will keep his commandments or no. And I said to you, humbling them was simply to make them dependable on God. Or sorry, to make them dependent on God. So, if the journey had lasted 40 days, the cattle that they came out of Egypt with will have been sufficient meat until they get to the promised land. But the essence of the work has not been learned. Why? Because the heart of it is to bring them to the place where they can depend totally on God. And I said to you, one of the greatest problems that you have is that there are places that you call your source. E.g. a job. Example, your parent. But when God was speaking about meeting your needs, he said, consider this sparrow. He does not have a job. He does not collect a salary. Neither does he have a bank account. Those are the three things Jesus said. He does not sow, 
Neither does he reap and he does not gather into bands. What does he mean? He does not sow means he does not have a job. He does not reap means he does not collect salary. He does not store into banks means that he doesn't have a bank account. Yet, your heavenly father, you see, as simple as Matthew chapter 6 is, I would have been thoroughly satisfied if, a, if I can only see a people who believe it. So somebody will ask me, so why do we go to work? The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him work with his hands that which is profitable that he may have to give. That he may have. Let me give you a second scripture. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So that you having all sufficiency may to. So why will God make you sufficient? So that you will have to give. So that you can participate in every good work. But God does not need your job for you to survive. He's too faithful a father to make you dependent on your job. See, for you to depend on your job is to insult his place. That's the reason why for some people economy change when government goes on strike. And sometimes those things happen to actually humble us. Because if before that time you were waiting for salary, now that salary is not coming for six months, <laughs> your face will look upward. Because the Bible says he caused them to suffer hunger. Why will he cause them to suffer hunger? So that when they become hungry, they will learn to look. But did they actually learn it? No, no. Did they learn it? The Bible says the word that came to them did not profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them. I heard it. So when they became hungry, what did they do instead? They complained. Why did they complain? Because they did not bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. That's why they complained. Because if he... See, that's the reason why when you see the movements of God, sometimes put it into song and sing it like the song of Miriam. Do you understand? You should learn to sing certain songs. And that's the reason why I tell you, don't sing songs you don't mean. Wake up in the morning, my ma, telling yourself, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my very soul shall shout, Hallelujah, praise God for saving me. Why did he take the time in Psalm 103 to count the blessing? It is so that his present circumstance will not insult his God. Oh, come on. Is anybody hearing me? I said, is anybody hearing me? Because Caleb, it was an insult on God that those people saw ten plagues. And as the plagues were happening in Egypt, Goshen was spared. Oh. Now you don't know what that means. I've experienced it once, so I know what it means. One day we were having a worship meeting on campus. And the rains we were attending, we lifted up our hands to heaven and we prayed. And we gave God thanks and we continued the concert. People came from town. From town to main gate, it was raining cats and dogs. From north gate all the way up, it was raining cats and dogs. But somewhere seated in that middle, there were no drops of rain. Do you know what it means? It means my hand is upon you. You couldn't have seen Pharaoh and his entire army drown in the Red Sea. And then you got to a point where you were hungry and then you thought that the same God who drowned Pharaoh and his army. See, before you think of Israel and begin to condemn them, start to look at you. See the number of times he brought you through. But see how much you are threatening him now. Because something is not working. And the real 
essence why God will permit a believer to enter into any dark day, see, see, is very simple. It's so that he can humble you. What does it mean to humble you? So that he can make you dependent on him. That's all. So that your eyes can leave the things that you trust. So you will hear the psalmist eulogizing God and saying some may trust in horse chariots, others in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. When they are brought down and falling, at that point we will be risen and we will be standing upright. Are you following me? Come on saints, are you still here? I want you to journey with me. Because if you don't understand these things in their very essence, there's no talk of the God man. I discovered that one of our major problems, Ima, is that once a problem rises before us, we don't even have capacity to think what is God saying anymore. Every prayer we pray is, Father, solve my problem. But God needs a generation that knows that the Father himself loves them enough for them to withstand their pressure. Uh, and then they say, uh, well, what about your school? He said, no, no, God is taking care of that. I am taking care of his business. Seek first the kingdom of God and his... So, what's your, what's your trouble? Do his bidding. His flesh we are talking about. All flesh is grass. And the glory, the comeliness of flesh is like the flower. So, when you hold on to living by the flesh, it's not like there will be no glory. Uh, does anybody understand what we just said? Yeah. If you decide to hold on to living by the flesh, people come up and they say, praise the Lord, the Lord promoted me my place of job. Were you the only one that they promoted? Even Abdul Muminu, Audu, was promoted on the same list. So, who should he say promoted him? Yeah. And see, see, now you are looking. No, you bought your house by storing up your salary. And Abdul Umar bought his own house by storing up. You see, the reason why we talk like this is because very soon your faith will be called to question. And somebody will show you the indices that there's nothing about your faith that is special. Your life is just going on normally. So if you don't have the ability to, in the midst of these things, see what it is that God did. There are certain promotions that you receive in the office because it is due. <laughs> Sorry. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, some self have overstayed. Now, if the Lord accelerated your promotion, do you know what I'm saying? If normally it will take three years for you to be promoted once, and in the last three years you have been promoted three times, then you can say that the hand of the Lord, by the favor of the Lord, But many believers live normal lives within normal contexts. And it is normal things they testify. So if your faith is truly called to question, you know that there's actually no testimony. Because Audu was promoted the same day you were promoted. In fact, by the next promotion, Audu was promoted earlier. And he was promoted because somebody sat down up there who wants to preserve the agenda of his God. And feels that if Audu overtakes you quickly, it will make that Audu will get the seat that you can't get. Sorry, can I go on? Don't be offended. I didn't intend to offend you, but if you're offended, it's all right. So, our ability to sit in the midst of our movements and say, see, by reason of this index and that index, I see the hand of the Lord moving in my life. Because many of us, even our indices, are indices that the normal natural man also points to.
very soon we should do a teaching here as to how to trace the movements of God. Because if you cannot trace the movements of God, because it could also be God that you were promoted the same day without do. But there must be some a testimony in your mouth that says, no, I was not promoted because Audu was promoted. I was promoted because the hand of the Lord was upon me. If not, even you too will start to think, okay, let's okay, let's let's do the test. Can we do the test? Okay. How was believed that it is God who supplies for us? It's very simple. We believe it's God. Okay, drop your hand. Let me tell you the real day of the test. The real day of the test is when you collect your salary and God says, bring on. And somebody didn't hear me. The amount of struggle between you and all is how much you believe or not believe that God is your source. Don't worry, I'm not collecting offering. You know I don't. So. I just felt somebody's heart skip. I say, hey, that's my salary. I don't want it. If God is talking to you, why not? Huh? Me? God has not said I should collect it. I'm just giving you an index. Something to use to test. So, George, it means that I should train myself in saying God is my source until the point where it is nothing to me. To give everything and go back home believing God. In fact, and also to get to the point where I have everything, but I yet wait upon the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like you have a five million in your account. And then you get up and they say, What are you waiting for? Say, I'm believing God. Say for what? Say for food. You know, naturally, you, you sound very stupid. How can you have 5 million in your account and you are waiting on God for food? Your brain should tell you to just go and remove money from your account and eat. At that point, you should be bold enough to say, you know, the Lord has not given me instructions concerning the money that is in my account yet. Uh, <laughs> you want to live the God life. No, no, you don't want again. No, no in, case, in case you want to go back to the normal life, we can take you back there. In fact, it's now easier to just be a nominal Christian. It takes nothing. Actually, the nominal Christian has no faith. That's the truth. The nominal Christian defends Christianity as his traditional religion. That's why we choose church according to our tribe. It's because it's a preserver culture. Are you are you still here? Don't vex now. I just started teaching. Some of you are boning. It's too early in the morning. Is anybody learning anything? Are we are we learning anything? That's how you know. So as I said, what should I cry? God said to him, cry that all flesh is grass. And that the glory is like a flower. Then he said, the grass fades with us, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord is upon it. Then he went on to say, the grass with us, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. But the Bible had said earlier, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see together. That means that what God will do, Toby, is he will take flesh. Then kill flesh in flesh and kill the dependence of the glory of flesh in flesh so that if another flesh is seeing this flesh, he will be thinking it is flesh but actually what is operational now is spirit. Oh, Because you see, God needs to reach that which is flesh and God cannot as a spirit reach that which is flesh. Hassan, let's do it. Please stand up here. Are, are you following me? God needs to reach that which is flesh. The world does not know God. You need to get it because if we hit Psalm 24, please stand up. If we hit Psalm 24, you might not be able to understand certain things we are about to say if you don't understand this kind of principle. So, God is targeting to meet flesh. See the choir, all of them are wearing black. So, they are flesh. Are you following me? This is flesh. 
e.g. carnality. Are you following me? That's flesh. Now, God is targeting to reach these people. But God is spirit. Do you understand? If you see the way I'm dressed today, you know I'm spirit. They are... Talk to me. They are... Uh -huh. Because they are flesh, the Bible says the carnal man does not have an activation to understand the things of the spirit. The reason is because they are spiritually discerned. Now, God wants to reach the carnal man here. Even if God shows up, that's the reason why the Bible said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, then we beheld his glory. So even God, when he wanted to reach us, knew that if we had come down from heaven as God, we won't, we can't get it. So what did he do? He became flesh like one of us. Do you understand it? So, if God wants to reach these people, what does he do? He takes up Hassan from among them. Then he breathes his spirit upon Hassan. And by breathing his spirit upon him, what he does is, he withers the grass and fades the flower. Now, these people are used to seeing him. Oh. Are you following me? Because they go to class together. They go to the market together. They sit in the office together. They do business together. Now, when God takes away that which is fleshly by the breath of the Spirit, He replaces it by the Word of God. But Hassan is still in flesh. But the principles of the flesh are no longer the things that are governing him. So God can now turn him and leave him as a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Then Debbie will now be looking at Hassan and thinking, but Hassan is supposed to be a normal human being. So they will look at Jesus too many times and say, what manner of... So he was a man. Didn't you hear... Towards the end of his life, he called his disciples and he said, Who do men say I am? And every man had an opinion that was not so. Because actually the best that they could think in their mind was that he was another man. But there was something they could not beat. They could not beat that among men he was, he was superb. You couldn't put him in class with men. So they would be thinking, what brand of man is this? That way, everybody down the hill wants to become the reality that they see in him. Can you see what evangelism is? This is what Jesus meant when he said, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Or you shall be my witness. The Bible didn't say you shall go and witness for me. So, God is not looking for people who would tell the world about Jesus. God is looking for people who will leave Jesus in the eyes of the world. So that if peradventure they tell about it, their lives will have first spoken volumes about the one they speak. Did you get that illustration? Thanks. Did you get it? Is the picture clear? So we agreed from Ezekiel 47. Please permit me so that we can run out of there. Because I need to get to Psalm 24 today. And this week I'm going to teach. It's going to be very intense. It's going to be very intense. Believe me. And so from Ezekiel chapter 48, listen. We find out that there's a river. That the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 48 that the river, is it 48 or 47? 47, that the river comes from the temple, from under the threshold, and it flows from the east gate. And then we went to Genesis chapter 2 and we saw the same river flowing eastward. Then we went to Revelation chapter 22 and we saw the same river flowing uh, 
flowing eastward. And they seem to have quite the same characteristics. Okay, three things. In Genesis chapter 2, we saw the river flowing from Eden. In Ezekiel chapter 47, we saw the river flowing from where? The temple. In Revelation chapter 22, we saw the river flowing from where? The throne of God. But we explained Revelation chapter 22 by saying in Revelation chapter 21 that there was no longer a temple in heaven. So the Bible says God and the Lamb were the temple of heaven. That means it is safe to say that the river flowed from the throne of God either because there was no longer a temple or because God was always the temple. That every time in the Bible, Scripture speaks about the temple of heaven. It might not have necessarily been talking about a building. Because, very simple transition in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul now came to a place and he said to you, God is no longer interested in dwelling in temples made by hands. Then he said, you are the... And the New Testament is actually supposed to be the reality of the shadow that is in the old. So in the old, the temple was a structure divided into three. And the Bible didn't say, tell Moses to build what he saw on the mount. He said, build according to the pattern. Are you following me? Are you following me? Now in the new covenant... We don't have to enter into anything divided into three. Into the outer court, the inner court, and the holiest place. Because we understand that we are now in the temple. Now, the reality in the New Testament and the reality in the Old, which one is more real? Help me. Which one is more real? Sorry, the reality in the shadow and the reality in the real image. Which one is more real? Old Testament and New Testament, which one is shadow? So you see, when the Bible spoke about a temple in heaven, it wasn't actually talking about a building. It was talking about a person. Because in the new covenant, when you talk about the temple, you're not talking about a building. What are you talking about? Sorry, can I find some temples here? Is there any temple of God here? Come on, is there any temple of God here? So, if the temple on the earth was built according to the pattern of the temple in heaven, which was the old covenant temple, and then in the new covenant, the Bible says you are the temple of God, it then suggests to me that the temple of heaven was not necessarily a building. Because the Bible said that if God was in a place, there would be no need for a temple. Revelation 21. The Bible says there was no need for a temple in that city because God and the Lamb was the temple thereof. That means that if God and the Lamb are present, there's no need for a temple. So heaven never had a building. As temple. Is anybody following me? I'm not planning to confuse you. I'm just planning to teach you. So where did the high priest take his blood to? Where else? He took it to the heart of the father. Because the heart of the father had been offended. It had been... Did you ever read your Bible that and he regretted God that he made man. That pain was what needed to be solved. Because if that pain was not solved, for all eternity, by the principles of divine justice, the Son of God cannot be restored into rulership. Because the first Son of God, Adam, traded his rulership to Satan for nothing. So the pain in the heart of God was not just that man offended. It was that man could not be the fullness of what he wanted man to be. Oh, if not, if it was that man offended, God would have never been satisfied until man paid. But who paid actually? God. If you offend me, who should pay? Talk to me. If you offend me, who should pay? God knew that if he waited for you till forever, you could not put yourself together to even know the amount of offense, then to know how to pay it. So he now came down into flesh, wore a body. 
and decided to pay the price as a man because you could never pay it. See, there was a song we sang in secondary school. He paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed the debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. Lord Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. See, he paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I can sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. Because Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. I want to say it again. See, he paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. Lord Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. You could learn it. Go sing it. He paid the debt. He did not owe, I owed a debt, I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song, amazing grace, Lord Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Try one more time, let's sing. He paid the debt, he did not owe, I owed a debt, I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song, amazing grace, Lord Jesus paid the debt that I... Now you can try it. Can I hear you sing? One, two, go. Now you have it. Can we sing it together? He paid the debt. He paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. Lord Jesus paid the debt. Can we sing it one more time? Say he paid the debt, he paid the debt, he did not owe, I owed a debt, I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. I can sing, now I can sing a brand new song, amazing grace, Lord Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. See, it wasn't that God was so angry he could not forgive man until he had punished man. No. It was that by the principles of divine justice, the sons of God couldn't take their place in rulership together with God because in the scene of Adam, what was shaded was actually the place of rulership. I told you that as this study continues, I will show you the reason why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil also grew by the river. Because I showed you that the tree of the the, the, the tree of life that was in the heart of the garden also grew where by the river. So the river that flowed from Eden to water the garden, it was by the banks of it. How did we know? Ezekiel 47, Revelation 22. The Bible told us that by the banks of that river grew the tree of life that produced the new fruit every month according to their months. So it bears reputation and it shows consistency in scripture that the tree of life cannot grow except by the river of God. 
showed you from Genesis chapter 2. We're still doing a review. I showed you from Genesis chapter 2 that the water that passed through the garden was not supposed to water the plants in the garden. Because the Bible told you how the, the plants in the garden were watered. The Bible says a mist rose from the earth and watered the face of the earth. But there was a particular tree that could not survive by the mist. That tree had to be planted by the river of God. So you hear scripture say concerning you, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a tree. What was he actually likening us to? It was likening us to the tree of life. <laughs> so when you say I am a life giving spirit what you are saying is I am planted in the Holy Ghost and the fruit that the spirit bears is love where does he bear it? from the tree who is the tree? I are you following me? I was listening to Pastor David preach on Thursday. I told you when I'm away, be careful what you say, because I'm still hearing you. I mean, what a powerful service. Were you here? Oh God. If you are not here, sorry for you. I was even sorry for myself, Makodi. When they came to carry me that evening to go for my meeting, I was angry. And I tell them, wait, I need to finish this service first. He was talking about God measuring a thousand cubits and taking us there. Do you remember? Which was the principle we saw from Ezekiel 47? And it is the same water, Debbie, that Jesus was speaking to the woman concerning in John chapter 4. And he said, the water I give to you will become in you a well springing up to everlasting life. It was the same river Jesus was talking about in John chapter 7. When he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And like the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. That means that the water comes to us and the water is released by us. Abi, let him come to me and out of him shall flow that means that, I told you, I said according to the formation of the garden, it is only the believer that has the privilege of both receiving the river and giving the river. The world has only the privilege of receiving of the river. That's why we are the life givers that the world is waiting for. Because it is our river that flows into them and heals everything that is dead in them and brings out productivity in them and gets them ready to be God's harvest. That's how some for, uh, it's for seven closed. And God only has one privilege to give the river. You can't give God the Holy Ghost. I tell the Lord, Lord, please come down. Let's fill you with the Spirit. So God has the joy of giving the river. Only the believer knows the joy of both receiving the river and giving the river. And if you don't know the joy of receiving the river, you will not even be enthusiastic to give it. Oh, Balakata. We need to change that now. You see, the real problem that believers have is the fact that we don't know the joy of receiving the river. Where is that psalm that we've been reading? There's a river that streams well. Psalm 46. Let's go there. Oh, oh. Hey, psalm 46. Oh, Shahana Katai. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible says God is our refuge and strength. What? A very present help when? Did you see that? God is our what? Refuge and strength. What is He? A very present help in trouble. 
So watch. He's about to show you a movement. How does God appear as a very present help in trouble? Verse 2. Therefore, what? what? Because he's present with us, what happened to us? We will not fear. Even though what? The earth be removed and what? The mountains be carried into what? We explained that from Ezekiel 47. That the sea is the end destination of the river. And the sea is actually speaking about the mass of the people on the earth. And we are actually the flow of that river. Because the Bible says in Genesis that that river enters into Eden. And going out of Eden, it breaks into four heads. One is the Gihon. The second is the Pison. The third is the Hidikel. And then the fourth is the Euphrates. And then the Bible told you that these were the rivers that were responsible for touching all the waters on the earth. And when you read it loosely, you'll be thinking God is telling you how the waters have life. No! That was not what God was talking about. He was talking about the movement of the spirit and how it touches the church. And then the church releases that movement into every sphere of the world. So the Bible says, even if the mountains, the place of government, is removed and thrown into the sea, who is supposed to rule? The church has seen an evil under the sun, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Servants upon horses and princes walking on food like servants. And when we say the church is supposed to rule, we're not just talking about going to sit down in a political office. We are saying supplying the mindsets that govern a day. Are you following me? There are mindsets that govern every day, Joel. Like you live in a day when the average girl does not believe that it's possible for her to do a relationship and keep the man if she does not give him somebody. Who is supplying the mindset? Definitely not the church. Is somebody following me? You live in a world that simply believes that a man cannot make it until he learns to steal. Who is supplying the mindset? So you see, servants are imposing mindsets upon us. See, see, you live in a world that they are trying to get you to believe that you are not fine until your cleavage is showing. Who is supplying the mindset? No, 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 talk to me. So suddenly, the definition of beauty is show something. <laughs> uh, you see, you see. Now, we're talking, because when we talk rulership, people are thinking that God is only interested in carrying believers and putting them in political offices. Well, God is interested in doing that because the Bible says when the righteous prospers or when the righteous rules, the city rejoices. But beyond that, it is the church that is supposed to be supplying the governing mindset of an entire generation. Even though by prophecy, God said, let them grow together. Meaning that as we supply our mindsets, the world will still be supplying their own. It is just so that nobody will be without excuse. There will always be a lighthouse on the hill. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. But you see, the real problem, Seth, is that even the mindsets we supply, we supply them religiously. We don't supply them with light. The world explains to the average girl that if she opens a cleavage, somebody will see it, you'll be interested. That makes sense. You that you're asking her to cover, what mindset did you supply her with? The only mindset she has is God is happy with you. And God is happy with you has never kept anybody from sin. Actually, what it has turned us into is we just think that there's one God sitting somewhere on a throne. And he takes pleasure in saying, love, stand up. Then if you stand up, say, yeah, good girl. <laughs> say, love, sit up. Then sit down, say, yes, that's my girl. They say, Joel, roll on the floor. 
Then when you say, oh Lord, then you say to you, you are trying me, go. <laughs> you know, the picture we have of God is that he sits down up there and he takes pleasure in controlling our lives against our good. Oh, that we might relate with simple scriptures like I know the thoughts that I think towards you. That if God said this is the way to live, he's not saying it so that he can get pleasure. Let me tell you the true pleasure of God. The true pleasure of God is that you prosper. So when God is stopping you from doing something, what is actually hurting him is that you will soon hurt. Excuse me. I've told you that your position can never change who God is. If we get to Psalm 24, I'll show you. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It wasn't a it wasn't he wasn't telling you I, pos- I own everything. He's telling you that when everything is said and done, I'll still be God. He's telling you that by the time you finish, when you finish all your braggados, nothing has changed about me. I told you before, while we worship, I said to you, if, when you say, Father, be lifted high, God's throne does not move a few inches higher. Say, oh God, be magnified. Then God will start growing big. Then when you say, I love you, Lord, then he'll start crying. <laughs> your worship does not change who God is. It only enhances your revelation of him. So when you are saying, be magnified, you are not asking him to be magnified on his throne. You are asking him to be magnified in your eyes and in your heart. So when you hear the songwriter say, and in my eyes and with my song, oh Lord, be magnified. That's a true perspective. Oh Lord, be magnified. Can you sing that? Be magnified, oh Lord. You are highly exalted. You are highly exalted. There's nothing you can do and there is nothing you can't do oh lord oh lord my eyes are be magnified be magnified say oh lord oh lord be mag say one more time say be magnified be magnified oh lord you are highly exalted there's nothing you can do you can't do oh lord oh lord my heart are on you be magnified be magnified say oh lord oh You see, when you say be magnified, it is you that sees God better. So that songwriter says, I've made you too small in my eyes. You see, God is a healer whether you ask him to heal or not. He's a deliverer whether you ask him to deliver or not. If God stops delivering on the earth for the next one million years, he's still a deliverer. If he has not delivered, it's because a generation has not risen that has seen him as a deliverer. So your worship does not increase God. Do you understand what we just said? Do you understand what we just said? Uh-huh. When you say, Lord, be exalted in all the earth and have your way in it, it doesn't make God start to do his plan. No. It reveals to you what the plan of God is so that you can start to do it. Uh-huh. Because at the end of the day, God's will will come to pass. Hosea showed you some of the highest dimensions of knowing God in Hosea chapter 6. He said, then will you know if you follow on to know the Lord that his ways are determined like the rising of the sun. So you can't change the ways of God. So when you think that you are slowing God down by not making yourself available, there are 10,000 other people who have already made themselves available because his word cannot fail in the days of his power, his people are willing. So it becomes your singular privilege 
to find yourself willing and available in the day of God's power because you don't know how many other people have said yes. Eliza came one day, I was making noise. He said, Baba, see, I, I dare to represent you, kill the prophet. One woman has been chasing me since, and you have not done anything about the woman. I'm tired. I, only I am left. All your prophets are gone. Some of them are backslidden and they are following by some others have been killed. God says, shut up. I have set 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to prove it to you. Go and anoint three people. Elisha, as prophet in your stead. So God was saying to Elijah, I'm not going to miss you. Then he told him, in fact, while you are making that noise, I have already found Jehu and Azael. God's ways are determined. If you don't yield, others have. I didn't say others will, I said others have. <laughs> Leave God though. And you know, there are certain things that are scary about God in the Bible. The Bible says that and God has no limitation to say whether by many or by few. So God can carry 10,000, the job of 10,000 men and give it to two small boys. He carried the job of an entire army in Israel and gave it to a 60-year-old boy. Oh. And at the end of the day, the job was done well. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Did anybody just understand what I just said? Hey, you need to understand it. That way you can't do guy for God. So if the Lord says to you, give, and you hold back, the project will still happen. Do you get it? Weigh it like that in your mind, Paul. When you do it, when you weigh it like that, it will make that every opportunity God gives to you, you will see it as a divine privilege. Because you will know that God can actually do without you. He has just chosen to do with you. That you are God's choice. And it was an election of his choosing. Is anybody following me? Uh oh, I said, is anybody following me? Is the God man we want to talk about? Oh? Because we have not started. you follow God like that I said to you the real problem with our perception is that we are thinking that God is sitting somewhere and his pleasure is just to control our lives and see us doing what he wants so that if we do what he wants finally on the last day he will open the gate of heaven for us then we will have escaped ma I discovered that if that's the mentality heaven is in trouble because when we have now finally made it to heaven, we will now start doing the things we didn't do. Ah, oh. oh, you don't know. You will still have a will in heaven. So, if you are living on earth and you are telling God, you see, God, it's because of you I'm not fornicating. No. I just want to make it, Baba. You see, your faith is not different from Islam. Because as soon as you enter into heaven, you are going to be asking God, where's my, where are my virgins? Is, is anybody following me? I said, is anybody following me? Let me tell you the truth. Your faith is not faith until we remove heaven and you are still willing to follow God. That actually, heaven is not a target for believers. That heaven is home. Home cannot be a target. It's where you retire to. I can't be walking in the afternoon thinking, will I go back home later? No, does, does anybody understand what I'm saying? How can I be strolling in the afternoon and I went to work? Then I ask him, I say, hey, I hope I will make it home later. Will I actually make it? If I get home, will they lock the door? No, I wish it came to you. 
that the real target of the of the children of God is to be pleasing to the Father, understanding that in the pleasure of the Father is their prosperity. God speaking by John said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. Imagine that. That's God's. Is God wishing over you? So what do you think that God's desire will be? If I said to you, I'm a genie, brother Aladdin. I'm the genie. You have robbed your lamb. I've now come out. If I say wish, will tell you. If I say say a wish or make three wishes, it will tell you the things that you treasure or, or, or desire the most. See, you're not likely to say that I may know God. You say I wish that I have a house in the center of the sea so that I can be seeing the view from every side. Then the house is so that you can travel on the house to land and travel back. Then I wish that the house will have garage and in the garage, not be garage for motor, be garage for speedboat. Because where the treasure of a man is, those are the things you treasure. If the Lord blocks you tomorrow and says to you, make a wish, Will you be as wise as Solomon? I can tell you the truth. Many believers today, if God blocks them and says, Miriam, make a wish. Some people say, ah, let my father never die. It's very stupid wishes. Solomon said, oh, that you may give me wisdom to rule over this your great people. That means Solomon had learned the awe of God from his heart. And he understood that it took God so much divine wisdom to be able to sit over a people and give them guidance. So his greatest desires were not things that were mundane. His greatest desires were things like, Lord, that, that I may know how you rule over your people so that I can also rule them too. God said, eh? As a man... You didn't ask me for wealth. I know what troubles human beings like you. You didn't ask me to establish your kingdom forever. He said, you sought that which is divine. Together with that which is divine, I give you wealth. And I establish your kingdom now forever. See, make the right wish. You get every other, every, every other thing with it. Oh. <laughs> is anybody hearing me? I said, is anybody hearing me? Desire the right things in God. You'll get every other thing with it. Seek ye first and is and how many other things? So to be looking for a car is to limit your options. Oh, I've never said it like that, but it's, it, it was sweet. Do you understand? To set your eyes on finding a husband is to limit your options. Lord, while I wait, I'm going to be here serving. I'm going to be doing what you have asked me to do. Lord, I'm not under pressure. Your sisters are saying to you, your years are counting. You are now 28. Say, so Lord, you have said none in Zion shall lack a mate. I'm not under pressure. So if you ever have to check, check, Lord, am I where I'm supposed to be? Yeah. Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And then you go back and focus on the assignment. Then it is the day we now say, come and leave place and worship you at 33. Then you now get up. You sing the song that everybody else has sung. He is Lord. A brother will be hearing, you are Lord. Someone who can listen. You are Lord. Amen. You have risen. Because you have been dead since. I've been looking for you for how many years? Does anybody, does anybody understand? Then when the brother comes to you, you are not running back on the pressure of I'm 33 now. You say, eh, shall we? Yes. You know, I was saying, shall we pray together? Then, then, 
Then to keep your shame, say, I say yes now. <laughs> yes, we can pray together. When your face told him that you are disappointed, uh, who wants to be praying at this age? Who wants to be praying? Does anyone understand what I just said? Do you get what I just said? Because actually, your anxiety can never produce God. Be anxious for mercy. Anxiety never gives you, gives you a God result. It will give you flesh and the glory. And every time you receive what is fleshly, you empower it to fail. Is any believer still here? Is any believer still here? <laughs> if we don't live like this, God, dear, we bring ourselves under the element of the world. And we can never get a God result because we don't have the God kind of faith. Faith. Does anybody help me? The God result comes from the God kind of faith. God has never been under pressure. He does not act under pressure. Stay where God has called you. You will find out that the hand of God meets you there. I said to you, when you focus on the things that are mundane, you limit your options. So you think your only problem is getting a husband until you get one. Then you know that getting a husband and building a home are two different things that require two different graces. Then you now discover that after you have even attempted at building something that looks like a home, then you have the challenge of raising children. So you live your life chasing vanity. But if you live your life chasing God, as your life unfolds, the revelation of that phase of your life comes with it. Are you, are you following me? Please follow me. Because if this is all we are going to do today, it will be important for you to understand what it means for you to first receive the river. I said to you, the believer does not appreciate giving the river to a dying world because he does not even know of the workings of the river. The average one of us, if we say Holy Spirit, the first thing that comes to mind is Re ma ma ma, ma 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 ma, Oh, if we say the spirit is here, people start to do as if they lick pepper. Go and join team cultural dance group and dance one game. It's more profitable for you because you see, TK, when you are done. Don't dance in your swange in church. The presence of the spirit is measured by tangible change. If nothing changed after your cultural dance, it was the Holy Spirit you met. Oh, I wish you heard me. Yes, because there's also an evil I see in my generation. Everybody wants impartation. If you touch it. it, it that's why I stopped many of those things. And it's not like you cannot be imparted by laying on of hands. Because that's the only pattern we have in the Bible. Lay on hands. But when hands were being laid on you, was there even faith enough in you to know? My problem with the people who even lay hands and the people who are receiving the laying is that the man who is laying is just saying, take it. What is it? Take it. Eat. Actually, what he's saying is you should fall. In scriptural pattern and order, before hands are laid upon you to say, take it, faith is supposed to be stirred in you in the direction of what the Spirit is delivering. So if I'm laying hands upon you to receive a gift of the Spirit, I need to have first stirred up faith in you to know that when the Spirit comes upon you, one of the evidences is that you will start to manifest certain gifts. 
You see, when it comes to the delivery of spiritual gifts, the Bible says, earnestly covet or earnestly desire the best gifts. Yet I'll show you the more excellent way. That means that if your faith does not rise towards a gift, you can't receive it. So if you see the operation of discernment, it's one of the two things. It's either you are amazed or you covet it. And many more people are amazed than they covet. I know I told you from the story of Jacob that being amazed does not deliver God to you. Because Jacob stood and looked at a ladder and angels descending and ascending and one on top of the ladder as a son of man until he woke up the next morning. Then he woke up, then he said, the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. In the day that mattered, God made the mistake and showed up again. Jacob held him by the belt. He said today, <laughs> he said you tried it before, I opened my mouth. Today, today there's no mouth to open, no. I'm going to wrestle into you until I get you. Excuse me. You know, when you read that scripture and you find Jacob saying, bless me. If I, you know, then we come to church. We have we written songs with it. I will never let you go unless you bless me. I will never let you go. Oh, I will never let you go. I will never let you go. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't. You put like that kind of thing in this church. We sing that kind of song. And in your mind, what is bless me? Give me money. Change my situation. Baba, lift me from this my level. So every time we are jacking God and telling him to bless us in the present generation, what are we looking for? By the time Jacob was saying bless me, he had prospered exceedingly. He had swept off the entire cattle of Laban. It was in his company. He had gold and silver. He was healthy. In fact, by the pattern of the patriarchs, nobody who received the blessing received anything natural. Abraham, the Bible says he shared his possession to the other children he had after Isaac. Then he called Isaac and blessed him. Isaac had Esau and Jacob. And of course, you know, Jacob stole the blessing. As soon as he got the blessing, he went into a far country. His father died in his absence. Who collected the father's property? By the time Jacob was blessing the two sons of Joseph, Joseph was too established for Jacob to be thinking of adding anything to him. Now, Joseph was even his savior. So, what exactly is the blessing? If we don't go back to the basics of the faith and ask the right questions, when, when we get to Psalm 24, I'm going to show you. But let me give you a heads up. Because in Psalm 24, the Bible told you that the reward of the man who will ascend is that he will receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Then in Psalm 23, the Bible says, There had the Lord commanded the blessing. The Bible didn't say a blessing, it didn't say blessings, it said the blessing. It means that there is something called the blessing. It's Galatians 3 that gave us an entrance to it. Galatians 3, verse 13, the Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Himself he made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is every man that hangeth upon the tree, that the blessing of Abraham. Now the blessing of Abraham is not Abraham's blessing. 
I took time and explained it here. Look for the message. He said that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. What's the blessing of Abraham? That we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. The Holy Spirit is the blessing of God. Nothing more. So when God blessed Jacob, what did he say? He said, you have become a prince with me because you have sided with me and you have survived. What does it mean? It means you can now carry my purposes. I told you the mark of that encounter was that God disjointed him. And it was on the strength of that disjointment that he leaned upon his staff to bless the sons of Jacob and prophesy concerning his twelve sons. And he spoke accurately concerning their future because now he had become a partaker in the mind of God. That's the blessing. Psalm 133 spoke about the priesthood of Jesus and spoke about the fact that the oil will flow from Jesus and flow to the rest of the body. Then the Bible says, there did the Lord command the blessing. And that was the prophecy that birthed Acts chapter 2. When they were all together in one accord. Oh, how good, oh, how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. One accord. For it is like the oil that runs from where? The Bible says it, it runs from the head. Do you understand? Did he say, the Bible says this said the blessing poured upon the head of Aaron. He said that runs from the head. And you know that the spirit was received from where? The head of the priesthood, Christ. Then the Bible says, and the spirit will not stop until he soaks the entire body down to the skirts of his garment. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. So Jesus released the Holy Ghost to us as soon as we came into one accord. That's the blessing. That's the oil. What does the spirit do? He brings life. So the Bible says, they had the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The working of the Spirit is what births life. People don't know. So when they stand before God and they say, Baba, bless me. I think God should give them an extra shirt. Oh. Actually, when you say, bless me, oh God, what you're saying is, Lord, teach me to walk with the Holy Ghost. Because even when it comes to provision, Luke said to you in Luke 11. Abi babe, it's not Luke 11. The scripture was considered yesterday. And, eh? Scripture said to you in Luke 11. How many of you fathers with your children ask you for bread? And give them. Or they ask you for fish. Or they ask you for an egg. He said, if you are men know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the father give the Holy Ghost? So if you ask God for bread, what will he give you? The Holy Ghost. If you ask him for fish, what will he give you? Because with the Holy Ghost, you will be led to a factory. With the Holy Ghost, you will not receive fish. You, you give a fishery. In fact, that was where we were going to. That actually the church does not know what it means to give of the Spirit. The Syrophoenician woman was commended for great faith. Because she came to Jesus and she said, Master, heal my daughter. And he said to her, It is not proper to take the children's bread. Excuse me. Children's bread simply meaning this thing is consistently available for the children. But for you, dog, then she said, Even if I'm a dog, I can wait on the edge of the table for crumbs to fall off the children. Oh God. That was what the psalmist was talking about when he said, my cup runs over. Nobody drinks your cup. They drink your overflow. Jesus looked at her and said, I have not seen such great faith. Not in Israel. You must, he said, go. Your faith has made you whole. He didn't say, I make you whole. He said, your faith. That you can believe what you believe. You are. And the children do not know. 
And so because we have not related with the spirit enough to receive healing, we don't know what it means to give it. I'm talking to you about the flow of the river. We thought two scriptures and then we'll pray. Because today, in the flow of the river, Edith, one of the things that we must do today is we must appreciate the reception of the river. Many believers don't even appreciate the reception of the river. The first thing Jesus said to that woman concerning the water is that if you drink it, you will never thirst. And you have a generation of believers who are in need trying to meet the need of the world. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? Go, go, go with me back to that scripture. Psalm 46. Give us three. Okay, let's read verse two again. Therefore, we'll, <laughs> therefore will we'll not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Verse three. Though the waters thereof roar, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Verse 4. There is a river. Can you read it out loud? Go. There is a river. The streams whereof shall do what? Yeah. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. So hold on. The presence of that river is actually the helper. And you know that nobody else was called paraclet by Jesus except the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the first ministry of the Holy Spirit is to the city of God. Because until the spirit has been has, until the spirit has been able to minister to you, you will not be able to believe in his ability to minister to a world enough to let his streams flow out. Of you. I'll give you one more scripture. Give me Isaiah chapter six one. Give it to me on the screen. Come on now, sixty one Isaiah sixty one. It was a scripture that Jesus quoted when he arrived at the temple. The spirit of the Lord God. Can we read it out loud? Go. The spirit of the Lord God. Oh, hold on. Now you see here, he wasn't talking about the spirit within. He was talking about the spirit. I told you about there are the, the two dimensions of the release of the spirit. The spirit within to give us direction. But the spirit upon to empower us to work. Are you following me? Now he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because... The Lord had anointed me. What does the anointing do? Talk to me. What does it do? It preaches good tidings unto the meek. What else does it do? It binds up the broken hearted. I'm showing you what the spirit will do when it flows out of you as a river. Number three. What does he do? He proclaims liberty to the captives. Number four. What does he do? He opens up prison... To them that are bound. Give me number five, verse two. What, did, what does it do? It proclaims jubilee. Do you know what jubilee is? One day we should sit down around the subject jubilee. What he said as to proclaim the acceptability of the Lord is to end all forms of servanthood and slavery. That the only kind of servanthood that su survives beyond jubilee is the servanthood that is called bond servant. So when you hear Paul saying, I, Paul, bond servant of Christ, you are saying, no amount of jubilee can free me from this service. <laughs> oh God. What Paul was saying in the Old Testament context is, he has carried me to the center of the city. He has pierced my ears. In ancient Israel, if you see a man with his ears pierced, he's a bond servant. Even the proclamation of Sabbath and the proclamation of Jubilee cannot set that man free. And that man is not taken to the gates by force. 
the Bible says. Now, let me give you the Old Testament context. Are you following me? In the Old Testament context, a servant is not only a servant. A servant and everything he possesses belongs to the master. So, if the servant, when he came, came with his wife, when you are releasing him, you are going to release him with his wife. But if the servant married a wife while he was serving you, if you are releasing him, you will release him and you hold back the wife. Because the wife belongs to you. Well, you can't live by the law. You will die. People who are looking for law, they don't know what they are looking for. And in case you think, well, that's the Old Testament, I'm no longer anybody's servant, it's a lie. You have a boss in the office. Is somebody following me? Please follow me. Because you need to appreciate the reception of that river. Isaiah in prophecy started to speak about what it does to the world. And you will notice that when Jesus quoted this scripture, he only spoke about what the river does to the world. And I'm going to tell you why. The reason was because the Holy Ghost had not come upon the rest of the church. So in the prophecy in Isaiah, it showed you what the Holy Ghost will do first in Zion. Which is what we just quoted in uh, uh, Psalm 46 verse 2. Verse 4. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. If you have not been gladdened by the river of God, you cannot take any glad tidings out. The glad tidings of God is come and see the man who told me everything I've done. That's the good news. The good news is just going out and proclaiming what God did in your life. Daring to believe that it is possible for him to do it in every other life that believes. That's your witness. Your witness is not to preach one scripture that you don't understand. And try to be breaking mystery from Greek and Latin. Your witness of the gospel is come and see what he has done in me. That's your witness. I told you, Jesus didn't say, and you will go and witness concerning me. It's you will be my witnesses. So these guys didn't preach what they didn't live. Are you following me? So nobody needs to teach you five steps to evangelism. You just go saying, he healed me. He saved me. You don't know where I'm coming from. He changed me. I suffered depression until the day he came upon me. That day when he came upon me like joke, I laughed all night. That's what the Holy Ghost does. When I woke up the next morning, my depression was gone. You have people who are depressed in church trying to preach the good news. Are you still seeing that scripture? Are you still seeing that scripture? Please see. Oh, I was telling you about the bond servant, right? So, when the bond servant, the Bible says, if you proclaim a jubilee, you must release all your servants to go. Except if the servant says, my master is a good man. And implying that, now this is, this is the implication I draw from it. Implying that my life can never be better than what the master has provided for me. Oh. Do you understand? If a master gave you the right to have your wife and have your own children and live your own life, you are just only accountable to him. He didn't oppress you. It was a kind of life that Joseph was living in the house of Potiphar. He was still a servant. But he was lord over the whole house. So he decided the disbursement of money. He was a big boy. Now if a servant stands and says, Hey! If I leave all of this that the master has given me, where do I start from? This man has been good to me. He has protected my interest. My children and his children attend the same school. He 
He takes care of my children as though they are his. Who would have provided this kind of life for me? If a man says, my master is a good man, I don't wish to be delivered from him. The Bible says, the master will call for the elders. Let them sit at the gate. Then the master will take the guy by the hand and take him to the gate and stand him out publicly. Do you understand? Then the man will make his declaration. I don't wish to be free from this master. Some of you have not made that declaration. I made it a long time ago. You see the servant who to Jesus, I don't wish to ever be free from it. That's why I'm bold to tell you I'm a servant of Jesus. When he has made his proclamation in the public, the Bible says his master will carry and pierce his ear as a sign of covenant that that man is now a bond servant. That his service now is not a matter of compulsion, it's a matter of choice. I, Chintok, a bond servant of Christ. You must be able to say it and put your name. Don't say it in a hurry. Sit down first. Because you see, one of the things that you must conclude before you can ever say it is, You are good and your mercy and your love. And your love never fails. Yes, your love never fails. You are good and your mercy and your and your love never fails. You are good, you are good, and your mercy and yours, and your love never fails. Yes, your love never fails. Say you are good. Oh, say, your love never fails. It never fails. It never fails. It never fails. Say, your love never fails. It never fails. Your love never fails. It never fails. Say you are good and your mercy and your Hear me. Until that goes beyond being a song into being a real confession. And that confession is not made in a hurry. You should know that by now. That the goodness of God is not just when you receive bread and butter. That the goodness of God is being able to trust Him even in the midst of your hard times, knowing that all things work together. If not, some of you will wake up one day and feel that you gave yourself to bond service too early. Because when Paul gave himself to bond service, he said, I suffered the loss of. No, don't you think that Paul should have sat down and had a reason to cry? Jesus, you cheated me. When you met me, I was traveling in convoy. Paul had a convoy when Jesus met him. A few years later, he was running out of cities in basket. I wish somebody understood what I just said. So for Paul, the measurement of the goodness of God was not even the things that were happening to him. Because he said that he considers that greater treasure. Or he considers everything he has lost as dung just to, for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus. Some people's value system is annoying. He lost convoy, lost horse. Lost professorship. Lost his seat in the Sanhedrin. Lost his very 
pharisaical robe. Lost his respect and dignity when he walks into the temple. Then he said, but it's better for me. Because as I lost it, I gained the knowledge of Christ. How many of you will be able to measure the knowledge of Christ and say, I lost a cow, but I gained the knowledge of Christ? Hallelujah! <laughs> no, do you understand what we just said? Oh, wait, do you understand what we just said? Before you say, I am a born servant, even your value system will have to change. Because the things you treasure must change. If not, if you have a master who doesn't treasure the things that you treasure, you might end up thinking he is wicked, but he was actually working out your good. We would have never heard the name Paul Shiva if he had continued on the path he was going. Now, no generation was born after him that didn't speak about Paul and the things he wrote. It is Paul's letter. He wrote a letter to his friend to receive a boy who had offended him. We are reading it as Bible. Oh no. You didn't hear what I said. Paul sat down. He wrote a letter to his friend. He said, I have Philemon. I'm writing because of Onismos. I know Onismos knows how to misbehave. But you know you too, you owe me so much. If actually you owe me under God and I've not held it against you, please don't hold the sin of Onismos against him. Receive him again and say, brother, I have been with him. He has repented. Paul wrote it as a letter to his friend. We are now reading it as Bible. So a man can get to a place in his walk with God where every word he says is as the canon of scripture. Oh God. If there's anything I desire in my life, Ada, is that I hit that point. That I'm so dead in God, flesh is so gone from me that every word I say, you can take it to the bank and cash it. You understand what I mean? You can write it down. Let 12 generations after read it. And they will still read it like the Bible. He was a man. He was a God man. Is anybody understanding our contemplations this morning? Because these are deep things. And I'm concerned lest I lose you while we are teaching these things. These are God things, man. If you don't want to travel far with God, these things can't make sense to you. You'd rather come to a service and we tell you, this week, your life will never remain the same. Then you shout, amen. Like my friend Francis would say. He said, this week, then he'd be like this. Like goalkeeper. Your dry days are over. Amen. If there's any oil on my head, I invoke the oil of my anointing. And today, I establish your feet steady, onward and forward only. Backward never. Even Bob Marley knew how to say that. Oh, you have not heard? Iron like a lion. In Zion, oh, you didn't know. I am like a lion in Zion. Uh, uh. I am lion, Zion, lion, da, da, da. He wasn't talking about your Zion, no. He was simply telling the government of Jamaica that there's nothing they can do about him. He carried a house where they smoke Igbo and do prostitution for free. He bought area near Jerry. In Jamaica, where the government house is. But Mali bought a house there for free sex and free prostitution and free smoking ganja and free everything. Government did everything to get him out of there. So he was answering them that he is like a lion in Zion. There's nothing you can do about him. Some of you sang things that you didn't know. You were very following Lucky Dube to say, I am a slave. A prisoner. I am a slave. I'm a liquid slave. 
he was saying that he cannot help himself he has to drink beer And his younger brother is turning the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus. You need to meet Benjamin Duby, man. God always, God always has a remnant. Forget about it. He leaves for himself a witness. I beg, let's stand close so that people will not sack me. No, it's people that employed me. If you don't give offering today now, how will I eat? Ha! Ah, please don't be angry with me, oh church. Please, all these things that I'm doing is for your good, yeah? Please, and when it's time for offering, don't reduce your offering because of my summer. I beg you so that they can pay my salary for this month. <laughs> oh my, if you do ministry waiting for salary, you will soon die. Like you will die. That's how one day you have council of elders who tell you, come, don't preach your cannot to you again. They say, yes, sir. Because they have to pay your salary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Hold on. Can we finish this thing? Can we finish this thing? That's how to be a born servant. A born servant understands the mind of his master. And his treasure, his value is measured according to the master's worth. Not according to the earthly ones. But the guy does not measure his faith by what kind of car he drives. No, he doesn't. Paul trekked between city to city. I'm sure one day when he was trekking, Satan was telling him, see, see the kind of soft by head life. When you got a letter from Damascus, were you trekking? Were you not on top of a horse? Which kind of God will now give you his own letter? Then I'll be trekking. Sometimes you even have transport. You have to use chains. They say want to release. You say no. Please, I appeal to the court in Galilee because you are looking for free transport. <laughs> oh, what kind of God? See the kind of God you are following. But Paul understood the value system of heaven. the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are not seen are eternal and that if you embrace the things that are eternal even the temporal things will respond to you in due season i read a, i read a book by bobby and god's word to pastors and then he showed some of paul's voyages i said deep paul now smart guy there are certain parts of paul's voyages that were written in the he said he passed this city and this city and that city they won't say anything that he did in the city. But beyond the went to study about those cities in the days when Paul passed through them. Then he discovered that one of the cities had the best wines in the world. So Paul also knew how to pass through certain cities so that he could rest. He found out that one of the cities had some of the greatest holiday resorts. Just very cool, calm places. Where you could just go take a room and lie down and rest. So when Paul needed to retreat, don't think he suffered only suffering. And then he just suffered and suffered till he died. Sometimes certain brethren came to him and said, Paul, you have suffered too many yokes. Please, would you go and rest? But he lost nothing in God. The things he was looking for was not wine. When he got it, blessed be the name of the Lord. Does anybody have this story? Are you getting it? He showed you what, as I asked one, let's finish. He showed you what the Spirit does in the life of people. We said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That was where we stopped. Then I started explaining to you what the acceptable year of the Lord is. The year when everything goes free. Until today, 2000 and plus years after Jesus died, it is still the acceptable year of the Lord. As soon as you believe it, you can liberate anything from any yoke. I'm showing you what the Spirit of the Lord does. That's the passing of the river. Next. And the day of the vengeance of our God. So it proclaims that God has liberated men 
But it also proclaims that there is a day of God's judgment ahead. That God is going to judge men for refusing the liberty that he bought at a great price. That if a man dies henceforth, it's not because God didn't make provisions for him, but because he refused the provisions that God had made. Is anybody following the story? Then the Bible says, and to comfort all that mourn. Verse 3. That's what we're going to. To appoint unto them that mourn where? Now you see, he's no longer talking about ministering to the world. He's talking about ministering where? In Zion. The city of the living God. See, you are going to see something now. You are going to see. Now, we must just pray on the strength of that. What do you do to them that mourn in Zion? The Bible says to give them beauty for ashes. And what? The oil of joy for mourning. And what? The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hold on. That means that God is interested in ministering to those in Zion. What will he do to those in Zion? He'll come to the place where there are ashes in their lives and give them what? Beauty. He'll come to the place where there is mourning in their lives. And what, what will he give them? The oil of joy. He'll come to the place where they have heaviness. And then he'll take off their heavy garments and give them what? Now, until them in Zion have this experience, there is something that cannot happen to them. The Bible says that they might be called. So why does he do what he did before? That they might be called. What kind of trees? The. So hold on. That means that a man cannot be said to be the planting of God. Permit me to add by the river of God. Until he himself has become a partaker of the river. Uh had illustrated to you earlier that you are the type of that tree of life that's what jeremiah captured when he said blessed is the man who's, who trusts in the lord and whose trust is the lord for he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers and you find out that there are trees planted in town are there not trees planted in town don't they bring forth fruit at least when the season is done but the Bible tells you that there is one who is consistent. And that particular tree is not planted in town. It is planted by the rivers. It does not depend on the rain. That's why the Bible says it will not wait in the air of drought. Nor will it cease to give its fruit. It will not worry when the heat comes. Except but its leaves will ever be green. That means there is an evergreen technology. That people can experience green from time to time. The average person in the world experiences green from time to time. Uh, but the river is such that when you drink it, the Bible says you will never thirst again. Even the people in the world, they enjoy bloom sometimes and gloom some other times. Is it not? But the Bible says that there is a technology that makes that you can enjoy bloom all the time. It was that technology Jesus was speaking about when he said, I have spoken these things to you that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but rejoice. That means that a man can be rejoicing in the midst of trouble. He must be planted by the rivers. Do you understand it? If a man has not encountered these things for himself, he cannot be called the tree of righteousness the did you see the planting of the lord listen to me if we must be the ones who must be givers of life and give the life of god to our world we must first be partakers of the same life so the psalmist will say in psalm 46 verse 4 there is a river the streams whereof makes glad who Eh? makes glad who come on makes glad who makes glad who who is the city of God somebody say I am the city of God 
Yeah, don't sit down like that. That's how you lose a meeting. Somebody say, I am the city of God. So the first responsibility of the river of God's spirit is to make me glad. He takes away my ass. He takes away my mourning. He gives me a consistency. That means, Margaret, until we see a particular kind of consistency in your life, we cannot say you have been planted by the rivers. You see, the consistency is not in the events that happen to you. Because if you go back to Psalm 61, it didn't talk about the events. It talked about your reaction. He gives them what? Beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of that means when they are supposed to be heavy, they are praiseful. Abi, when they are supposed to be mourning, they have joy. What the Spirit of God does is not He excludes you from trouble. He becomes your consistency even in the midst of trouble. Oh. Until you can say, I have enjoyed such comfort from the Lord. Even you are not planted by the rivers. So you are not motivated enough to tell a people what the rivers can do. If you have not been through a hard time and you found yourself consistent in the hard time, even you do not know what it means. Sorry, let me say it in English, Malame. If you are a seasonal Christian, when things are hard, we sit on your face. When things are not working, you have turned 64 years old. Then when things are working, you can say, hey, how are you? <laughs> Wookie, look, I like you. See this, your hair. Oh, Wookie. We know you are fine, that, that day. The day your money is depleting, when what is remaining in your pocket is 300 naira, And there are still 15 days to the end of the month. And because your supply comes from your salary, you are walking around. They say, ah, brother, no. It's a fine. The reason is because with every step, you are calculating how it's done, then I survive the next 14 days. That's way we know. Even you have not tasted of the river. Uh, so to be a producer of the fruits of the tree of life, there's a consistency that must come with you. For he will be like a tree planted by the rivers that bears its fruit in season. What does the tree of life do? What does the tree of life do? The Bible says it bears one kind of fruit according to the month. So Jeremiah said to you, you too, you'll be bearing your fruit month in, month out. Because for you, there's no dry season and rainy season. It's a perpetual continuum. You are a, you know, you are a green plant every time producing your fruit every time and as your fruit is dropping just the production process is continuing you didn't wait to produce fruit then grow old then rain will come then you come alive that's the salary system oh are you i wish you had me what's the best day for workers civil servants 24th the 24th one day before they greet you properly the reason is because my suffering is over. Tomorrow is coming. Madness. Before tomorrow, you are finished eating the money. All of us shut. Is anybody hearing what the Spirit is saying? If you don't hit that point in consistency, even you cannot produce the fruits of life. So you are not an in weather, out weather Christian. You are not a pastor. Pastor, since I started serving God faithfully, they have just been talking about me. They have been talking about me. Is it wrong for somebody to serve God? Who do you think they should be talking about? The Bible says if you belong to the world, the world will not hate his own. There are certain things you should know in scripture and not to be stable. When they say, you are swag bear, you say, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. Because somebody has to look at your faith now and call you a slacker because you are not doing the things that you used to do together. Then you come to me and say, Pastor, I'm losing all my friends. What do you think? Look at 
to lose them now. There must be a consistency. That's the time blessing when you are losing your friends and you are shouting, Hallelujah! Then we say, what's wrong with you? He said, see, the people who don't look like where I'm going to are going. So that God can make space for the people who can help my destiny. Because you know the Bible says, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts. It's not an English saying. It's scripture. Until we can see that level of consistency in you, it means that you too have not tasted of the river. Second Corinthians 1 verse 2 will say, Blessed be God who comforts us in all our troubles that we might... So where does God comfort us? After our troubles. In our troubles. So if you are going through a trouble and we don't see you comforted, even you have not drank of the river. So you can't have boldness enough. So you see, the river of God is not braggados. You know, ah, the power of God is here. The power of God is here comes long after you have shown the fruits of consistency. Is anybody still here? Come on. Is anybody still here? Listen to me. If there's any prayer we should pray tonight, is Lord, I have come. First, let me drink of the river. I remember Pastor David was telling us on Thursday that we must measure a thousand cubits more. That you might be enjoying the ankle depth and be thinking, oh boy. And if you don't desire, you cannot go to the knee depth. Or you might be enjoying the knee depth. And he said something very profound that day. He said, and you know, at knee depth, if you lie down, actually you might still be able to swim. But it doesn't change the fact that the waters are knee depth. And any time your feet touches the ground, you have some dry parts outside. Some of you know that you have made progress in God when it comes to stability. But that there is a measure that you need to go still. Some of you know that right now, you are more assured of his presence than you were three years ago. Abi. But you still know that you have not come to the fullness of the knowledge of I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can we travel a thousand cubits? Oh. Well, you can say, okay, Lord, I desire some level of stability because if I cannot find beauty in my ashes, if I cannot find the oil of joy in my mourning, if I cannot find a garment of praise in the times when I'm supposed to be healthy, then I cannot be able to boast that I'm a tree of righteousness, the planting of God, and that God is glorified in me. Today, I came to speak to the people who want to say, let the fruit of the tree of life come out of me. And I give you an invitation to come a little deeper. I give you an invitation to deal a little more with some inconsistencies. Some of you are too emotional by every standard. Every decision for you is emotional. If somebody laughs at you, you laugh back. If the person is boning, you presume that he talked about you three days ago. That's the reason why he came out today boning. There's a place where you will see people boning and you'll be thinking, oh, he's the one who needs help. I need to give him There's a place where people don't greet you. And you don't go away thinking, ah, who are they? Why, why didn't they even greet me? You go out of your way and walk up to them and greet them, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a place where a brother is showing signs that he's displeased with you and does not want to talk to you. And you tell him, for the sake of the corporate existence of God for which we stand, Paul, what is the problem? I've seen the way you have been doing the last three weeks. If I've offended you, sorry. It's such a place. It's a place of consistency. And one of the things you saw today 
is that when the spirit blows upon you what he does is he kills flesh so the things you are holding on to because of your fleshly pride is the reason why you'll be offended and somebody will ask you and say no there's nothing that one too is pride because in that what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to show yourself spiritual if i say there's something wrong now everybody now be thinking i'm the one who is canal i'm holding grudges but you actually are are you not there's a place in your work with god where you can be consistent so that in the places where you even find out that you are weak, you can easily lift up your hands and say, I receive grace. Can you lift up your voice and pray? And say, Lord, I'm that man. I need to go a thousand cubits more with you. With you. It's a prayer nobody can pray for you. Nobody will even give you points to pray. If the word of the Lord has come to you, then you will find what you need to pray. Today is that kind of day of decision where you decide whether or not you want to go for our God. People keep their work at the nominal level and God has no problem with them. But today is that kind of day when you want to decide, Lord, I, I want to make my work with you very serious. If there's stability available in you, oh God, I want to begin to experience it. I can't be up and down. I cannot be hot today and cool cold tomorrow if there's such a place in you where i can receive the oil of joy for mourning where i can receive the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness where i can receive beauty for ashes lord i want to go to that place because that's a place where i can be stable enough to be a tree of righteousness the planting of my god and that god in me is glorified lord i want to be that tree from which people come to pluck the fruit of the life that comes from within you for the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness gentleness meekness self-control and against such there's no law i want to be the kind of fruit that law cannot speak against i want to buy your spirit be the kind of fruit that law cannot speak against and today is that kind of day when i make decision of how far i want to go with you and lord i decide I made up my mind a long time ago. I made up my mind a long time ago. I made up my mind a long time ago. Lord, I want to go all the way with you. Tell him, tell him, Lord, if there's a depth in you, I want to find it. Paul prayed it. He said that you might be able to comprehend together with all the saints what's the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth of the love of God. And that you might be able to perceive the love of God that surpasses that understanding. You've been filled with all the fullness of God. There's such a place. There's such a place. Lord, there's such a place in you. And I desire today. There's such a place in you. And I desire today. Tola Kamana Kabato, Rebecca Soprana, Stabaka Tehias. Payelo Toski, Brena Castabate, Cosebre Ketos, Kinasa. Sisoma Nakai Bakur, Bagabagaski, Procotion, Mugata, Hinana Tahaya. Yoskoma Nakai Kaparo, Bakasabraka, Gabasabria, Gabasso, Bogos, Pekate. All we want is you take over, take over. See. 
Why nothing, nothing else but you? All we want is you. Take over, take over. Till we are consumed by nothing.
Holy Spirit, we ask that you take us from here and lead us. Just take us from here and lead us, O oh God. Consume us with everything that is you. See, I will arise and follow you, O oh God. Oh, Savior, please pilot me. Through all the way to everywhere Savior please I love you Lord we ask that you lead us from here consume us with all of you show us your goodness Show us your grace. Bow our hearts consistently before you. And lead us. In Jesus name and all the people said. Amen. Please take your seats.